ready for the next session. <laughs> We're going to kick off the session with a joke once we can finish writing it. <laughs> so why did the WordPress freelancer go broke? Drupal. Oh, <laughs> that's not that's good one. No, that's they were too free? <laughs> it was too free. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> they, the punchline chat GPT came last month. It was really bad. Because he couldn't find a premium theme that didn't cost a nominal pay. He couldn't find a premium oh. theme. <laughs> 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 oh oh secret a secret prize for whoever can come up with the funniest WordPress joke. <laughs> anyway, is it 215? That's what I have. Yes. Great. Green light. Sal Frillo. This session is called Fun with the WordPress REST API. So Sal is a WordPress developer at WebDev Studios. He is passionate about code, web development, and Git version control. He has contributed to WordPress Core, the Genesis framework, and is the author of the Stop Emails plugin. Sal's previous experience as a magician slash juggler, computer science and mathematics teacher, and radio DJ makes him an entertaining and engaging speaker. He has spoken on a wide variety of topics, including object-oriented PHP programming, enforcing, enforcing code standards with PHP code server, WordPress post meta, and using Composer. Sal is also a proponent of developers blogging and shares his development notes and tips at Sal Ferrello. Sal Ferrello. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone who wants to follow along for the home game, Thank you. The, the home game uh, at salcode.com slash WCM. That's like WordCamp Montclair. All these slides are available there, and they'll be available afterwards as well. But if you want to pull them up now, you certainly can. When I was growing up in my family, Sunday lunches were kind of this family tradition we would have. And my grandfather loved this one sandwich shop where we'd get the sandwiches except for they consistently got the order wrong, week after week. And my grandfather really tried, right? Eventually he got, went around to the family, wrote down all the orders, even took them in a day early and handed them over. Still, sandwiches were wrong. So he goes to the owner and he says to him, listen, we love your sandwiches, we'd love to keep coming here, but you keep getting the order wrong. What do we need to, and the owner picked up a piece of paper and handed it to him. And it was an order form. Right? Each sandwich had a row, and there were columns that indicated if there were toppings to add or toppings to remove. And so that week, my grandfather filled out the form and handed it in, and lo and behold, the sandwich order came back right. So the problem we had here is not that there was bad information or anything like that, but the problem was the information was not in the right format. And that's exactly what we're talking about when we start talking about the WordPress REST API. Right? We're used to WordPress displaying all this content for us here in the form of a web page. But that's not sort of this consistent data format that we can take in. This is not that sandwich order in this very regimented format. The REST API is. Now, this is a custom REST API endpoint that I've added to my website. I even have the link down at the bottom. If you click it, it'll come up. So this just says owner, right? And it provides this information about me, the owner of the website and WCUS. Uh, those are the ones I've made it to in the past. I'm looking forward to adding 2023 to that list this year. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Yes. <laughs> Great. So now we've got WordPress kicking back data to us in that very regimented, formatted way. And this has got a lot of power to it. So why, right? Why does this power, why is this important? Why do we want this here? So as an example, here is my website, right? And imagine for a moment that you are tasked with extracting when this article was last updated. As a human, we can take a look at this and we can read it and we can see when this, this was last updated. But imagine you had to do this programmatically, right? So you can write some code that loads all this content. You've got all these HTML tags flying around. Maybe you write some code that identifies the words uh, last updated on and then you take the content after that, and then you stop at the word buy. So that's not insurmountable. But if you write that for my website, it's only gonna work on my website. If you go to someone else's website and try and run the same thing, you're not gonna get the right answer. Maybe they don't even provide that last updated information at all, right? It's not anywhere in the source code. So in that case, right, we can still tease it out because this is the REST API response for that same blog post. 
And so this kicks back all that data to us in that super regimented format, in that sandwich order way that we can predict exactly where each piece of data is going to be. As a matter of fact, I wrote a Chrome extension to do just this because I knew exactly how that response would come back. Now, whenever I'm on a WordPress blog post and I say to myself, this information seems interesting, but is this outdated? This kind of looks like something maybe that's, let's see how recently this was written, right? And I can click this and it will tell me, oh, hey, Sal, this was written in 2011, right? Maybe I want to go back and check. <laughs> All right, so reading. We've got this very regimented way of reading this data out. That's great. But in the words of the TV announcer, that's not all. Right? We can write as well using the REST API. So here I created on my website an example page, salferrello.com slash example. And I titled it my example page. Now, I can make a REST API call just like this. And I'm setting the title. We'll dissect this a little more later in the talk here. But you can see in the title, my new title. I'm passing that information in. And when I do that, that page gets updated. And now we've got new information. So I can do this programmatically and pass this information in. So this is the before and after slides, right? We've got the blog post uh, or the page as I initially created it. And then the updated page that has the new title after we run that code over it. So these are really the three big ideas that I want to talk about today. One, we can read from the REST API. We can get this data back in this very regimented format, and there's cool stuff we can do with that. We can write to the REST API, so we can use these regimented rules to feed information in and change them. And then finally, we can add our own endpoints to the REST API to do whatever we want with. <laughs> so let's talk about JSON for a moment, right? This is JavaScript object notation, uh, and it comes back like this, right? We've got our information coming back. Again, this is the link. This is the endpoint I created. A little bit of a comparison in case, like me, you were a strictly PHP person. That's where I used to live, right? It was all PHP. There was a little bit of jQuery every once in a while. Uh, but I've started delving into JavaScript a little bit more, and JSON really is based on JavaScript and the way the objects are notated, hence the name. Right? So the difference I just want to highlight between sort of PHP and JavaScript. In PHP, when we create an array, we really have two different types of arrays. Right? One type of array has keys and values. Right? You set up an array, you give it a key, you give it a value. Key, value. The other type of array is just a list of items. So for example, with WCUS at the bottom there, I have just that list of items. There's no keys involved. Uh, they're numerically indexed automatically, but we're not defining them. So this is what we can do in PHP. JavaScript, it does not work that way. In JavaScript, if you want to have key value pairs, you are not dealing with a JavaScript array. You're dealing with a JavaScript object. So in JavaScript, to define an object, they use the curly braces instead of the square brackets. So we've got an object with curly braces, key value pairs. And then if we do want to have values that are not keyed, right? they're just numerically indexed, like WCUS, then we do use the square brackets for uh, that even in JavaScript. JSON has a few other rules, like things have to be quoted all the time, um, but that's sort of the big ones. No, no trailing commas in JSON object notation as well. That one burns me so many times and the validator throws an error. What's wrong with this? Right, so trailing commas just to clarify, right? After this, we might put a comma as we did in the PHP. If you try and do that in a JSON object, it's gonna throw an error for you. Now, if any of you have been playing along with the home game and you've clicked this link to my website, you might be looking at what I've been showing you and say, Sal, you're blowing smoke here. This is not what it looks like to me, right? If we take a look at this, you may be seeing something a little more like this. Right? We get the information coming back and it's all crammed together, right? So we would call that unformatted JSON, right? It's coming back. It's not so pretty to read. And maybe you're very mentally flexible and you're saying, well, that's OK, Sal. I can figure it out, even if it's not all pretty printed up there. And while that's probably true, some of these JSON responses get a little larger. And when we don't pretty print them, it looks like our machine threw up on the screen. Right? I imagine this is what computer vomit would look like. Um, so <laughs> we don't want that. right? We want our JSON to be formatted. So the trick I like to use when it comes to formatting my JSON and getting a nice 
uh, pretty way to look at is a Chrome browser extension. And when you run this Chrome browser extension, automatically, anytime you hit one of these URLs, like this one, right, it comes back to me formatted. So I find this to be a really useful tool if you want to play around with the REST API. So the one I use is JSON view. I've got links to it, and I've got links to the source code. So personally, I recommend that. I think that helps. Now, if you're using Firefox as your browser, Firefox has this baked in. So if you're using Firefox and you hit one of these URLs, it looks good right out of the gate. No extra processing necessary. If you really have a chip on your shoulder about browser extensions and you don't want a browser extension, there is a trick you can use that you run from the browser console to get your stuff back and pretty printed. Um, it's this code snippet. If you drop it in, it'll do that for you. So I've got this link in there as an option. Uh, this links to a blog on my website, a blog post on my website. Okay, so, so now we've got this pretty thing coming back and we clicked on that URL and we saw what it looked like, but how do we land on that URL, right? That's a pretty long URL we were looking at a moment ago. And to sort of put that together, where does that come from? Well, when WordPress renders a page, there are lots of tags on that page. And some of those tags are not things that turn into visual elements that we look at. One of these things is a link tag like the one on the screen. It sets a link tag, it has a rel value of alternate and a type of application JSON, and it points to the corresponding REST API uh, route for that blog post. So I went to that um, URL at the bottom, and when I looked through, I found this tag. As a matter of fact, here's a screenshot of it, right? I've got lots of other code, but when I look in there, that code is there, and that href value is pointing right to that URL. So I can gather that. You can do this on any site you want to. You can go to the WordCamp Montclair site, go to one of the blog posts, and if you view source, you will see this same link in there. It will tell you exactly where to hit the REST API to get the response for that object. So because we're programmers, we love if we can automate things. So it turns out we can automate this, right? If you've used uh, any kind of querying language in JavaScript, or maybe use jQuery to target something, uh, or even CSS, right? We're targeting an element. We can target that element that we just spotted here. Document.query selector lets me do that. And so I'm going to query it with this, and I want a link tag, and I want it to have rel equals alternate and type equals application slash JSON. That comes back. I get a DOM element. I want the href value out of it. And so if I run this, oh, and we'll talk about how we run this. If I run this, I get back that URL. So I can get this programmatically. So in terms of how do we run this, right? We're running uh, JavaScript in the browser. And I'll be talking a bunch about this. And so this is, if you open your developer tools, you get your console at the bottom. Is that showing up big enough? Da, 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 da. We can make it bigger. There we go. And we can have any sort of JavaScript in here at the bottom that we run. And so specifically, the JavaScript we're talking about running on our WordPress blog post is this. And it comes back with our URL. Yeah, there we go. We can see a successful run of it. So now if you want to go to that WordCamp Montclair blog post and you don't want to go and sift through the uh, tags yourself, you can instead run this from the browser console and get back that URL. Great. So we got that. We had the URL. If we hit the URL, we've got all the information there. Yeah, let's go back and do it. Right. So it's here and we run in our... Um, browser extension, so it's all nice and pretty printed for us, and we can see everything here, pops back our data. Again, though, we say, hey, let's do this programmatically. And so we can do this in JavaScript. Right? So this is the code. Essentially, we would swap out that middle line for whatever we need to hit. Right? In this case, we're hitting this uh, REST route. And so we've got this, and we've got it with the blog post 6799. And we've got these await keywords in there. We're not going to dive too deeply in JavaScript, but this essentially is asynchronous JavaScript. What happens is the code starts to run, and JavaScript just wants to keep on running after it kicks off that function. And by putting await there, we say, hang on, wait for the response to come back, and then we're going to operate on it. So first we wait for the response to come back, and then we turn it into a JSON response, and we wait for that to come back. So we run that JavaScript, and then we get back this object. So this is the object that corresponds to that post. This is what the REST API has on it. And then finally, we can take that response. We can stick it in a variable. I called it JSON data. And then we can call JSON data dot modified because that object that comes back has that modified property in it that tells us when it was last modified. 
And so by putting all those pieces together, that's exactly what I did to create that browser extension, right? So here's the code running. This shows us it. So we can take that apart, right? So this browser extension, when I hit the button, it looks over the page. It does that query to find that link tag. It finds it. It looks at the href value. And then it makes that call to that href value. It comes back and it looks for the modified value. And that kicks it out. So that's all the, the secret sauce going on there under the hood. Same origin policy. This one's easy to get tripped up on. When you're running JavaScript in the browser, there is a rule hard-coded into that browser that says if you are doing one of these fetch commands to go out and grab some information, you may only do it to the same domain you are currently on. So if I'm on my website and I open up that browser console at the bottom and I take this code snippet and I say, hey, I'm going to go grab some information from a blog post. Let me go grab it from the WordCamp Montclair blog post. That's going to fail because that's on a different domain. I need to be hitting stuff on the same domain. So a great way to play with this is go to your site, open up that browser console, and then you can drop in these code snippets and it'll fire along and get you there. So how would one go about exploring the WP REST API, right? There's a lot going on here. And, I, and I've given this a lot of thought and I think the best way to do it is actually to start deep and then work your way back out. Right? So we've got this deep link here that takes us to a blog post. We're looking at one specific blog post. We've got the data. We've kind of looked at that ad nauseum here. I think we get the hang of it. So that's that data. If we start lopping things off our URL, almost like we're on the website, right? And you've got this deep URL and you say, I want to work my way back a little bit. Let's see what else we have here. So if I take off that last bit, the post ID, then we get posts. This will give us back a list of all the posts. It's a lot like when you hit your blog uh, page and it lists your most recent blog posts. So we can do that and take a look at it. These will come back, right? And this comes back, we get this object here. And then you can see we have a second object. So that is the second most recent thing I published. And we can take a look and we can get the third object. So you can take a look through and work your way through this. Single post, all posts. Okay. And then if we lop off posts, right, we get WP slash V2 routes. So at that point, we're pulling some more information. So if I pull that up here, this is interesting in that it shows us the different routes that are available to us, right? There's the one we're looking at right now, WPV2. There's posts. We just looked at that. That gives us the list of all those posts. There's posts with this thing at the end. This is a regular expression that represents a number there that tells it, hey, you can have posts and then have a number at the end. That'll get you that blog post. Oh, hey, it turns out there's another one. If we put revisions after that, we can get the revisions for that post, right? So we can discover what's going on here. We can pull a specific revision if we give it that second ID that belongs to the revision. Uh, auto saves are available, right? We'll go a couple more. Pages. So not just posts, but we can do pages as well. We can continue going down here. All these WPV2 ones are the ones that are built into WordPress core. Now, we go back one more level, we take off that V2, and we get no root was found? I feel a little misled here. I thought we got to explore this thing. We could go through. But this one comes back with an error, 404. We'll talk about this in a minute, about why this one comes back as an error. And then finally, if we get to back to WP-JSON, this is the root of the REST API. And so this is going to be our top level. And this has everything, right? So there's a lot. You can see the one I added. I'm hosting on SiteGround, so you can see that gets listed in here. Yoast, I have in here. So all of these different things come back. Okay. So if you want to play around and look at all the different options that are available to you, that's a great way to do it. So let's look at the structure of this call, right? We've got the base, which is our URL and typically WP-JSON at the end. This can vary a little bit from site to site. There's ways to customize it, but most of the time, this is what you're going to find. But then the part that... WordPress cares about is this route on the end of it, right? Like WP slash V2 slash post slash 6799. That's that path that takes us exactly where we want to go, okay? So our base, and then we've got our route. The route, we can actually break down further, right? So the route, the first part on it is called the namespace. And the idea is that if I want to add a new route, maybe somebody else has added that same route. 
right? With the same name, we come up with something to name like post. Maybe I want to add post, but WordPress core already has that. So I use a different namespace on the front of it. So now we're querying sal code v1 post instead of wp v2 post. And those are two different things. We can respond with different things and we don't mess each other up. Right? And as a matter of fact, here's mine. With the route I have, sal code v1 owner, that's that custom endpoint I added. And the namespace on that is sal code slash v1. Now, the v1 slash v1 that we add on there, that's not forced by WordPress, right? That's just part of a string that I decided to use. I could have changed that. I could have done sal code dash v1. I could have done sal code v1 with no dash. I could have called my namespace tuna, right? So there's no rules here about what your namespace has to be. Typically, Right? Sort of the guide that people follow is you go with your identifier and then a slash v1 or v2. The idea is you're setting up versions. So this way, if I want to change what my route responds with in a breaking way, I can do that under v2. So somebody else can still hit that v1 version. So it's versioning your endpoints here. But so this namespace, that's the whole thing. The slash doesn't have to be in there. I'd like to revisit now. When we had no root was found, when we went to wp-json slash wp. So remember, our namespace here is wp slash v2. So when we call just wp slash, we're giving it part of a namespace. We're cutting it off. So that slash in there isn't really part of it that we can jump around in. So it's just like I gave it part of my name, right? Instead of sal code, I wrote sa and then I hit enter, right? It's like, whoa, there's no namespace that matches this. And we get that error. So that's why we saw that error when we were cutting off our slashes working our way back. In the world of other things that can go wrong, right? You're exploring the REST API, you're taking a look at all these different things, and one of the things you see is this site health URL. Oh, this sounds interesting. Let's visit this. And we go and we get this REST forbidden message. REST forbidden, right? I thought the whole idea is we could go and look at all of these things. It gives us a status of 401. Uh, these are HTTP response codes. 200 is when we have a success. 404 is one we're probably pretty familiar with when something is missing. 401 is when you are not authorized to view that. Right? So this is telling me, hey, you're not authorized to do this. You can't look at this. And the reason we're getting this message is because WordPress doesn't know who I am when I make these REST calls. This is just an anonymous call coming in. Uh, here's the same call now from the browser console. Right? This is running that code. It says, hey, whoa, you're not somebody I trust here. This isn't anybody I know. So then how can we get this, right? How can we get authorized? And the way we tell uh, WordPress who we are, right? So we've got the same call that we're making here. This fetch command that we're using in JavaScript allows you to pass a lot of different things. One of the things we can do is we can pass a custom header in. And specifically, the one WordPress is looking for is x-wp-nonce, and then a value to go with it. So when I pass this value in, then all of a sudden, I get a successful response back from the REST API. It says, oh, hey, sure. Oh, this is Sal. Yeah, you can take a look at this. Here's what I've got for you. Enjoy. So that comes back. All right, but that's coming back because I added that extra value here. Right? This nonce value tells it who I am. Now, this nonce value is not always going to be this string. Right? Uh, even for me on my site, it's going to change every 24 hours. This one has already expired, so don't run out and try. <laughs> but, but you need this specific thing. This is your key identifier. Right? And the way you get this, a couple of different ways. Right? If you are on an, any WP admin page, so you're writing code that runs in the back end of your site, there is a global WP API settings, and it has a property called nonce. And so if you put this in your browser, you will get back this string. So you could use that. If you were doing work on the front end, you can hit this endpoint. And when you hit this endpoint, it will look at your cookies and figure out who you are and then return the nonce, and then you can feed it back in. But all of this is a lot of work. And the WordPress core developers looked at this and said, this is a lot of work. I wish this were easier. And fortunately for all of us, they made it easier. So what they did is they introduced wp.api fetch. So this command has all of that header stuff we just looked at baked in. 
it finds that nonce value and attaches it as a header when it makes the call. As a matter of fact, this call, you'll notice it only has one await, while my other fetches had two awaits. And that was because in addition to the fetch, I was also decoding it to JSON. This does that all baked in. So this is taking care of lots of the legwork for you. So anytime you can use it, your life is better <laughs> than when you are making those fetch calls, particularly if you need to go find that value and stick it in there. Right? So I think here's, yeah, here's an example of it running. Right? It goes through, <clears throat> and the call gets made, and our value comes back. Notice, I am not doing anything here with nonces. Right? I'm not pulling some value from some global or doing anything like that. It's all just baked in, and we get to ride on that, which is a pleasure. Now, WP API fetch is not available everywhere. Right? Typically, by default, I think it is only available on your editor pages. So if you have a page open to edit, like a page or a post, uh, then this WP API fetch is available there. But for example, on the front end, it is not available there. Um, so, but most of the code I do tends to be involving the block editor within Gutenberg. And so in those cases, this thing is there and ready to go. And so my calls get way easier. Now, updating title. We looked at that example all the way back at the beginning. Now, you can imagine that when updating a title, you want to make sure you have an authorized user, right? I don't want anybody to be able to show up on my website and drop some code in the browser and start updating titles. I know these programmers, right? I would have a lot of pages with the title butts, butts, butts. <laughs> yeah. So fortunately, right, you need to be authorized. But we just looked at what we had to do to get authorized, right? We need to pass along that nonce, or we can use that API fetch, which makes us authorized. So here is our call that updates the title. This is the same one from the beginning, but we glossed over it then. But we were using that API fetch. So by using API fetch, it grabs the nonce, it knows we're legit, and it allows us to make that update. So just to compare here, our read and our write, notice we're hitting the same path, the same route. We're going to the same place here. But when we want to write it, when we want to change it, we're passing in the data that we want to change, and we're passing in this method. In the read version, there is a method, the default. It's get. By default, you're getting information, you're pulling it in. In this case, we are posting information that we want to change. It's going out. Uh, when I think of, yeah, when I think of these routes and how you can do different things, right? I think about a big room full of desks. And route and point are words that get confused sometimes. So we're going to talk about here, along with that, how these are different. So we've got this room. It's got all these desks in it. And the route is how I get to the desk, right? Maybe it's WP, V2, posts, and then the number, right? That's the route that takes me to a specific desk. I get there. And then once I get to that desk, the default is I get whatever's there. Right? Maybe I'm grabbing a paper off that desk. I follow the route. I get there. I take that paper. But taking that paper is an endpoint that is part of that route. So multiple endpoints can have the same route. So the route is getting to the desk, but the endpoint is that desk along with what you're doing. You could be getting the value, or in the case of when we updated the title, we are posting the value there. Right? When we make that update, that's a different endpoint at the same route. So to me, routes are like, paths that get us there. And then the endpoint is what we do when we get there. So we looked at reading. We looked at writing. We've got our authenticated REST calls going on. Now we're going to add our own REST API endpoint. We saw this one earlier that was spitting out uh, my information there, right? the owner of it. So to do this, we tap in. So the first thing that needs to happen is our code needs to run at the right moment. If our code runs too soon, it does not work properly. And so that's what this code is doing. We're saying add action, REST API init at that moment, right? So set this up. When that moment occurs, then run my function. My function here is called sal code owner REST. So we get to that point, my function runs, and what do we do inside that function? Well, we call register REST route. So essentially to register it, right? This is what we need to do, but we can't do it too early. So that's why we have that initial add action. We register the rest route. We give it the route in two pieces. The first piece is that namespace. Right? We're saying this is the namespace this is going in. And then the second piece is the rest of it. In my case, I just called it name. And then we need to give it at least two properties here in the form of a PHP array. The first one is the callback. 
Each job will be to return whatever it is we want to spit out. And the second one is called the permission callback. Here I'm using the built-in WordPress function return true. I suspect you can guess what it returns. Right? If you haven't used these functions, they're super useful. There's some great helper functions in WordPress. This one, its whole job is just return true, so you don't have to go write your own function that has a return true in there. Right? So you save a little time. All right, so it returns a true permission callback, comes back. And then we take a look. So what does Salcode owner callback look like? So this is that function that returns our data that gets dumped out. And we're passing back, this is a PHP array, right? This is going to get transformed into that JSON object. PHP array, we've got name, first, last, WCUS. Comes out, we get our endpoint, it spits out. I do have a GitHub link there to this code. If anybody wants to pull it down and play with it on your own, you can add your own endpoint and mess around with it. There's our result. That's what comes back. So calling back to when we had that rest forbidden problem, right? We hit rest forbidden and we said, okay, we need to be authenticated. We had to go through and figure out the nonce and everything like that. So this code does not, right? We don't have to be authenticated. Perhaps we can guess what we need to change to cause that message to come back, right? That permission callback function instead of returning true every time, we can put our own function in there that does some kind of check, right? Does this user have the capability that we need, right? Is this user one who is allowed to look at whatever this information is? And that's essentially what they're doing there, right? So if you're adding this endpoint, if you want to restrict this so not anybody on the internet can hit it, then you want to use something other than return true there. And they'll get that 401 error when you return a false. And when you return a true, the data comes back. So where do I put this code? I always like to talk about where I'm putting my code, right? We've got options when we're building code. We can put it in our theme in our functions.php file. This is a quick and dirty one. I imagine most programmers here have done it at least at some point, right? But this one is a ticking time bomb because when you switch that theme, then everything goes out the window, right? So you can write a custom plugin. It takes a little bit of work. You got to put some headers up at the top. The other tricky thing I find about custom plugins is I have to remember to activate them. I've been burned more times writing code. Like, why is this not working? I don't understand. Oh, oh, the plugin's not activated. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right. So that's one of those moments where it's a good time. I'm reminded of the idea that whenever you get jammed up, you're supposed to just step away. And I'm not good at that. But I feel like that is one of those moments where I would step away and come back. And then the moment I got back, I would, it would click. But the third option, right, is the MU plugins directory. And if this is not on your radar already, it's a great one to know about. Right? So the MU plugins directory is this directory where if you drop a PHP file in it, WordPress automatically loads it, right? It automatically gets run. And so if you're taking a look at your code or at your uh, site, excuse me, you're looking at your site and you look for this directory, it's in wp-content MU plugins. Now I've shared this with other people and they said, Sal, I looked, there's no folder there called MU plugins, right? Thanks for the tip, but that's no help. Um, and in fact, there's not by default. Now, depending on your hosting, they may have that folder there. But in many cases, uh, and if you run, spin something up in your local machine, this folder won't be there. But WordPress is hard-coded to look for it. So this is a great trick. If you build it, they will come. No, uh, if you add this folder, WordPress will check in it, right? So if you add MU plugins and then you drop a uh, file in there, like here, MU plugins, owner-rest.endpoint.php, WordPress will automatically load that and it gets run. So it's kind of like putting your functions.php file. However, it's not tied to your theme. So I find this is a great trick that I use all the time, and my goal is to make sure everyone knows about it. So if you're writing code and you're playing around with this, great place for when you're testing. Okay, so going back to that same origin policy, we talked about how we can only request information from our own domain, right? So that sounds great, but there's all this great REST information out there. As a matter of fact, there's a weather service that I signed up for that has all this great weather information coming in in JSON format, but it's on a different domain, so my JavaScript can't touch it. Right? So in that case, what you can do is you can write PHP code that reads their JSON endpoint and then spits it back out at your own JSON endpoint. And so this was really fun, and I did this. Uh, and if you take a look at this URL, oh, nope, nope, that's the, uh, this is the one where we've got, right, so here it is. So this is my website spitting out weather data for my home area. Um, but it's all coming from this other service, but it comes out on my website because I'm grabbing it and then spitting it back out. 
And so what that means then is I can run JavaScript on my own site that can grab this data and use it. So that's super exciting to me. And that's what I did at the other link that I jumped to too soon, right? So I've got my own little weather application here and it spits out the weather for me at home. And I really enjoy that and it's geeky and I can customize it and my wife's in dermatology so I can make sure that I put the UV index on there so that we have it available and ready to go and I don't get in trouble for not wearing suntan lotion on days I should. Uh, so this code, right? This code is all lives in GitHub. I think this link goes to it there. It does, right? So this goes to that. You can take a look at it. One tip when you're doing code like that, right? You wanna make sure that you cache your results. The last thing you wanna do is have, you know, the uh, endpoint on your website. And when you hit it, it goes out and grabs somebody else's website. Going out and grabbing it from somebody else's website in terms of time, is an eternity in programming time, right? Instead of things just running on your machine. So when they hit your site, if every time somebody hit that endpoint, you went out and hit that, and you get people hitting that multiple times, your, your server's gonna fall over, right? It's just too much, it's not made to take that. So when my code's using a transient, what happens is it pulls in that value and then it holds on to it. I think it's 90 seconds, and then just keeps feeding it back, right? So even if I hit it multiple times or somebody else, uh, my family wants to know what the weather is right by our house. They can do that, and we're not hitting that all the time. So that, uh, I've got a list of resources here. Some of those go to blog posts that I've written there. We can run code in the browser and pretty print URLs, all that fun stuff. Uh, I am Sal Farrell. I'm a developer at Web Dev Studios. I appreciate your time today and being here with me. Thank you. Any questions? Does Core have caching built in on the post endpoints? Does Core have caching built in on the endpoints? No. Okay. And is there a fear of like, getting DDoS with all those open endpoints? Is there, uh, I don't know. I haven't heard about having that price. So are we, I'm not sure we should be having this conversation here and all of this, right? Evan's like, hey, if I keep hitting this URL, will your site go down, Sal? I'm like, huh, that's a good question. But, Mm. So I think that is a deep question. I would love to chat about this more after that. No, no, I mean, I think it's interesting stuff. Yes, but yes. Okay, great. Other questions? Okay. Sure, and actually, I think you need an introduction here. We are very fortunate to have here with us Cadam White, who was one of the lead developers on the REST API when it was integrated into WordPress core. And so this talk would make no sense if not for his hard work. Thank you. <laughs> At the end of the day, the answer for is, is there a concern about DDoS? Yes, I think that like you can bring a WordPress site down any number of ways. The REST API is probably the easiest, but it's particularly like it's it is possible. And so most of the enterprise tier hosts like WordPress VIP um, do put REST API get responses through a layer of usually CDN caching that has a short time to live. So that you're not going to be hitting it live every time. Um, and it's some, something that kind of has to be host specific. It's not something that I think the you know, dream hosts and blue hosts of the world or GoDaddy would necessarily get value from including, but by the time you're big enough to worry about someone coming after you, um, usually you're on a host that is gonna have something set up for them. Can I ask about that? Do they have a good time caching for that kind of, like you have that caching is it going to value? So um, it's going to depend on those. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Well, thank you all for being here. Have a great day.